Good evening. My name is Bonnie Marmer, and I want to welcome you to the event for this evening, uh, our Wetlands Committee webinar on local shorebirds, sponsored by the Point San Pedro Road Coalition. Thank you for joining us. Our featured speaker will be uh, Rich Semino and uh, our wetlands chair, Winifred Dejani, will be introducing him in a little bit. But while people are signing on, I see we're up to 42 participants already. We expect, uh, oh, over 70 signed up, close to 80. So I wanna take a few minutes just to say a few things before uh, I bring Winifred on for that introduction. Um, and uh, I, I want to, first of all, thank Alan Shavitz, our webmaster, for all the technical support and making it possible for us to conduct these webinars. Uh, without, without Alan's uh, work on these projects, we just couldn't do it. So thank you, Alan, our, our webmaster par excellence. <laughs> and um, I also want to thank everyone for being here. I'm so glad you could join us. We do have the capacity for folks, um, I think, to um, let us know a few things. Um, I'm hoping you can later on do some uh, Q&A for us. We're gonna save some time for that. Um, we, uh, so you can put some comments in the Q&A. Um, I'm hoping we have some new, new people joining us and that may never have been here for a uh, coalition event. If that's so, let us know about that. We'd like to see new people um, get involved with the coalition. One way to get involved is to go to our website and sign up for our email list if you're not already on it. I urge you to do that. That's sprcoalition.org. Um, and you can get our emails. We promise not to fill up your inbox with frequent emails, but you will uh, enjoy announcements that are of interest to people who live in our community. And um, we will make that relevant and timely. And you will learn about our area. This is one way for you to learn about disaster prep, about uh, our uh, issues with the San Rafael Lock, Rock Quarry, the Lock Loman Marina, uh, roadway issues, all kinds of things. Just to go to our website, you can peruse it um, and get our occasional emails. So we'll, we'll keep you up to date on everything about the Point San Pedro Road Peninsula that you could want to know, including our history. Um, there is a whole section there of history you may not know about this area, and I invite you to take a look at that. And if you happen to have any old photographs that might be of interest to others, send them our way. We're trying to add to that. I recently um, was walking around the neighborhood and met some folks who had some old photos that I think are, are great. Um, so if you have something like that stored in an attic or a basement, uh, scan them and send them to us. We're always trying to improve our website and, and make it more um, informative for people who um, would be interested in things like the area history. Uh, so um, we are now up to 50 participants. I don't want to take too much time. I do want to um, uh, remind folks, uh, if they don't know, that um, we can uh, provide closed captioning for you. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there are a couple ways you can do it. You'll see the little CC in, uh, uh, at the bottom and an arrow next to it. And you can actually choose to have a full transcript. Um, you can have subtitles, you can have both. Uh, it's up to you what works for you, but I welcome you to use that. Uh, and that helps not only the hearing impaired, but everybody to track what's going on here. So um, please uh, take a minute and sign up for this closed captioning if that's helpful for you. Um, one other things I wanted, one other thing I just want to mention, um, and that is because today is Giving Tuesday. And a lot of us have been inundated with requests for donations for so many good causes. Of course, the Point San Pedro Road Coalition is a 501c3 tax uh, tax deductible donation for you to the extent you're 
accountant says you can take that deduction, uh, please feel free to use the donate now button when you go to our website and um, support us by making your donations um, where they, they count, right here where you live, right here in our community. And um, we so appreciate that. But we also want you to um, uh, know that we want to encourage other donations. Um, certainly Audubon, if you're interested in, in birds, is a great place to send a, a nice donation. And then in these tough times, of course, um, there are the food banks and the Canal Alliance and so many local good causes that um, you probably are aware of, but we want to remind you it is Giving Tuesday and we hope you will be generous if you are able. And um, I just got a question in the Q&A and that question is, will the presentation be recorded? And the answer to that is yes, we are happy to let you know uh, that the presentation is now being recorded and we will post it on our website. So uh, it is, it is um, being recorded and um, we are pleased that we were also able to uh, record Rich Zemino's previous presentation, and that is uh, available on our website too in our archives. So you'll be able to uh, check that out if you missed it. Um, we are continuing to get new people, more people signing on, but I know that Rich has a lot of information uh, for everybody. And I think I've covered the main uh, points I wanted to make before turning it over to Winifred, our committee chair. So um, Winifred, I'd like to have you uh, say hello and I want to greet you and turn it over to you. Hi Winifred. Okay, thank you Bonnie for that wonderful thank you. introduction. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, for those that uh, don't know me yet, I'm I'm Winifred Tajani and I am the chair of the SPRC Wetlands Committee. And I feel so fortunate to live amongst the wetlands that interweave our community. And I get so much pleasure out of walking amongst them regularly. Um, there's so much bird and other wildlife to be seen. And it's always changing uh, because our area plays an important migratory role migratory role for many of the species who stop off here for very varying lengths of time. Uh, the Wetlands Committee is committed to conservation and education uh, pertinent to the environment and wildlife in this area. And we welcome, strongly welcome all attendees who feel uh, passionately about these things as well. And we'd like to invite you to attend our next meeting in January, if you are able to. The third week, it's our meetings are always the third week of the month at five o'clock. We haven't determined exactly uh, which day it will be next year. But um, if you're interested in having us send you a save the date, then just go to the wetlands page on the SPR Coalition website and fill out the contact form and we'll keep you updated. And we're gonna recap everything we've done this year and start planning you know, our action items for 2021. And tonight, as Bonnie already mentioned, we're very excited to welcome Rich Semino back. He's, by the way, is a member now of the uh, Point San Pedro uh, Wetlands, Coalition Wetlands Committee as well. And he's going to give a presentation about these migratory birds that I was just mentioning. It's specifically about wintering shorebirds. Uh, Rich has been birding in Northern California for 54 years. He gave an amazing presentation this October about the Vox's Swifts who roost yearly in the chimneys of the McNears Brickyard. And if you weren't able to see it live, as Bonnie already mentioned, it's recorded and available for viewing on the website. And Rich is also the leader and manager of an international bird touring company, Yellow Bird Tours, where he's been taking people on tours all over the world, birding tours for the past 22 years. So the cool thing about Rich's presentation tonight is it's about the birds in the area right at this moment. So afterwards, you'll be able to go out and see the same birds featured when you're walking around. 
So without further ado, I'm gonna let Rich take the floor. And after this presentation, there will be a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And um, you know we'll answer them uh, when Rich is finished with his presentation. So Can everyone hear me? Ellen? Yes, fine. Very good. Excellent. Good evening, everybody. How's everyone doing tonight? <clears throat> so um, a lot of what I um, have on the front end of tonight's presentation has been covered um, by Bonnie and, and uh, to John. And so basically, um, San Pablo Bay and the San Pedro Road wetlands area is uh, quite an area and it's developed. And of course we have the marina and we have the grocery store and we have a couple of marinas, um, but the, um, the way things have been developed, there's still quite a bit of habitat uh, left for um, birds. And uh, the birdland sign here is uh, by the fish and a tackle shop on a little pier off from um, the main marina at, at uh, Loch Lomond. I thought that was humorous, so I, and it had a gull. But you can see the development behind us. And um, okay, here, are we sharing screen? Hmm. Okay, there we go, slide two. <clears throat> Uh, so as I just mentioned, both the bay and the wetlands are an important part of migration for many species of birds. Um, despite the, uh, the amount of development that's taken place, it's, uh, it's still a home and it's still a, an area that's been used for probably tens of thousands of years and just handed down from uh, bird families, whatever their lifespans are, to the next, to the next, to the next. And it... Um, it's a wonderful place to bird, a wonderful place just to take a walk if you're not a birder. But if you're interested in, in birds, um, try to have a pair of binoculars. And tonight we're gonna to cover a pretty good cross section of what you'll see. And um, as you can see, there's about 150 migration routes across North America. And um, with global warming uh, coming on, a lot of these are shifting, uh, both in this time cycle, the timeline that birds arrive, both going north and, and coming south. So that's starting to change as the globe uh, warms and the neotropics um, begin to, um, to get warmer quicker and the birds sense they need to go north uh, to nest. And their uh, nesting cycle typically has been uh, timed uh, for optimal feeding in the various habitats that they occupy for, uh, for breeding. So at the far left here, where my cursor is, um, you can see we're on the Pacific Flyway, and the flyway splits right around the Bay Area, probably a little bit more inland, probably a little bit further south. <clears throat> and we have some birds that go north through um, the Sierras and the Cascades and, and follow an inland path into uh, Alberta and British Columbia, etc. So um, <clears throat> What's going on with these wintering birds? So as I just mentioned, tens of millions of birds begin arriving in San Francisco and San Pablo Bay uh, in early, early August. Some birds get here actually in very late July. And they come from their nesting uh, season in the Arctic and other remote areas in, uh, in Canada and the uh, Northwest uh, provinces of Canada, all the way up to the Arctic Circle. We don't have it here tonight, but if you were to go in the Central Valley, for instance, snow geese and uh, Ross's geese uh, and those types of uh, larger birds, tundra swans, they come all the way from sometimes as far as Hudson Bay and up into the Arctic Circle. So many of these birds arrive in their breeding plumage uh, only to, um, I wish I could get some of these, uh, let's see what we have to do here to minimize um, a couple photos here. Uh, Al, could you take down yourself and Winford and Bonnie? Um, you're in my screen here. Okay, I got it. Very good. So, learning here a little as we go. 
So many birds arrive in their breeding plumage and they phase into their winter plumage after their long flights um, into their wintering grounds, which includes this area that we're, we're all so fond of and what is our home. So uh, going off an app by Cornell University, the app is called eBird and um, it's available to everyone. It's at no charge. And uh, if you go into that app, it has a lot of different um, links into different sources of information for overview. And I went in for uh, specifically for Loch Lomond and a few of the wetlands in the area there. And there's up to 150 species that have been recorded in this area by bird watchers that come and um, record their birds either on their cell phones as a mobile app or go home on their desktops and record. So here's another map, another migration map. It's a little bit more detailed, but you can see uh, where my cursor is. So we have that a couple of the Pacific flyways up to three. And then we have one that comes out of Alberta and further uh, east into Manitoba, Canada. And you'll see these birds coming through here. So they may not reach this, um, the actual uh, migration path is here, but birds filter out, as you know, they fly. And the red area is about where we are. It may be a little bit mismarked, so forgive me. But in the general area, we do get uh, birds that um, are typically on this flyway that don't reside all winter. So you always want to keep a lookout for something different. And we find these birds in a lot of different habitats. This is uh, the uh, Bayland Trails Park uh, to the west of Andes Market. And it's a, a tiny park with some really nice uh, coastal oaks. And um, some of the birds you'll find in there will be the golden uh, crowned sparrow, comes from the Sierra Nevadas, the Cascades, all the way up into British Columbia. And you can find them in Anchorage. So they have a really long migration coming down. And then the hermit thrush right here, which also is a, is a mountain breeder and follows just about the same, uh, the same migration path as the sparrow. These two birds were photographed um, on September 24th in that time frame, in the park. So um, the sparrows and, uh, well, all the birds uh, have a, a little bit of a time clock. They have a timeline when they leave their um, northern nesting areas and start to make their migration south. And it's uh, sort of humorous, but you can expect white crowned sparrows, not pictured here, and the golden crowned sparrows to arrive around September 24th with that full moon. So you want to watch your garden for those. Uh, they're a garden bird, they're a ground feeder. And the thrush uh, is a berry feeder. So if you have a uh, pyracantha or a toyon bush or anything of that neat, uh, that type of species of shrubs in your front yard, backyard, you might want to listen for and look for the hermit thrush. So we have a number of uh, different habitats, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier on. We have the offshore islands, which is part of the San Pablo Bay um, uh, National Wildlife Refuge. That's a very important designation. Uh, there's a reason for that. They uh, have studied these two islands and they know that they're prime for nesting and wintering and even summer resident birds. So they've taken them off of public access um, because they are a refuge. And then when you're looking at the islands, you'll be on the uh, breakwater for the marina and uh, you might see this bird. This is a Forster's turn and they're a fish eating uh, turn, they dive. Uh, you might see them resting on the rocks. Um, but for the most part, they're off fishing and diving. And um, they're a colorful bird. You can see that orange bill with black tip, that beautiful black head, long wings. And uh, they have a cousin that's here, and it's the elegant tern. And the elegant tern uh, is not a year round resident. It uh, nests in Baja, California, and further south and in Mexico, uh, but mostly in Baja. And it finds a, it does a, a north south migration in the winter. So we start seeing this bird in August, September, and they come through in fairly big numbers. Um, they're not an individual bird, they're a communal bird. Uh, this photo here was taken by the ferry over in Larkspur. And that day, I think I had 250, but there's been reports of these birds in Marin County, closer to the coast, like Bolinas um, Lagoon, where they've had up to 5,000 in one day. So it's quite a, quite a scene and I'll go back. And they, they're a fishing bird, just like the foresters turn. Uh, foresters you find in small groups, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, possibly family groups. And once again, the elegant turn, our summer visitor who does a reverse migration, he comes north in the summer 
<clears throat> and excuse me, in his fall in the winter, instead of going south. And here's a, a larger grouping of those birds. So you should look for those. We may have those in the wetlands and certainly off of um, the Loch Lomond Marina rock ends there out towards the islands. And then we have um, snowy egrets. They have a nesting colony on the San Pablo Bay Island, of the National Wildlife Refuge. So we have quite a few of them in the area. Um, and we also have a lot of uh, great egrets. They nest over in Ben Lomond, excuse me, in uh, Bell Marin Keys. And here's the black neck stilt. It's a wading bird, long bill, feeds in the mud on crustaceans. And uh, this bird here is mostly a inner mountain bird um, in the Great Basin area, Sierra Nevadas and east into Montana and Idaho and Wyoming, uh, Utah, uh, wherever there's wetlands in Nevada, you'll find them as a nesting species. And they do a typical east-west migration in the winter. Uh, they start arriving again in August with their uh, juvenile birds or what we call uh, HY or hatchier birds. So they spend mm, probably eight months in the Bay Area and do a migration in the West for nesting in the various wetlands in the states that I mentioned. And this bird here is a, a greater yellow legs. And um, you may find very small numbers of them in the uh, wetlands of the Sierra Nevada or Cascades, but you really find them further North um, in Alaska, um, all the way up into Nome and into those uh, uh, regions there and inland into British Columbia. They're further north migrant. And they do the same thing. They, uh, they start to come down in uh, end of June, early July when their nesting season's over. And they'll stay here till March, maybe middle April. And then they take off again to go north uh, for a, a nesting cycle that, as I just mentioned, is, um, is over by July and they start coming south for the winter. So an interesting uh, set of birds there. So here's an interesting photo. Uh, on Wednesday, November 24th at 4 p.m., an American bald eagle flew out of the uh, San Pablo Bay Islands and flew over San Pedro wetlands over by McNear um, uh, Brick Factory, and I was able to catch a photo. So we have at least two pairs of uh, American bald eagles nesting in the Bay Area. Uh, two years ago, we had a pair that were nesting um, near Owen Pauly State Park in Nevada off of Highway 101. Uh, they did not nest this last year, uh, 2019, 2020, but they were in the area. And then there's another uh, pair further down in the peninsula, uh, more towards San Francisco Bay. So not only when you're off walking, uh, might be walking your dog, walking with your friends or walking with a pair of binoculars or a camera, and some of the birds that we're talking about today are all down close to ground, but you also want to look up and you might get something like this coming through the American bald eagle. And we, they're in the area. Uh, I've also seen them over by the uh, Marin Rod and Gun Club over off the, um, near the bridge from um, the property of the Rod and Gun Club. I've seen them fly by on, on several occasions. So I sort of always keep my eye open for them. I know they're in the area. So San Pablo Marina near the Bay Islands uh, uh, National Wildlife Refuge. This is a scene off of um, um, the breakwater behind Andy's Market there. And it gives you a look at the habitat. There's a lot of things going on here. There's a lot of open bay water. There's the islands. There's a breakwater. There's a lot of uh, wooden um, uh, posts that were put in for either uh, flood control or managing tides or tie up for boats. And then a lot of concrete waste was added uh, to shop, stop erosion. And birds like all of this. Um, as I mentioned in the very beginning, the area that we're focused on where we live here in, in uh, the uh, San Pedro Road area is developed, but um, plenty of habitat for the birds to uh, continue to make home here. So um, see if I'm gonna drag this puppy down here. Yeah, good. So a typical summer scene, in the marina is the brown pelican, also a nester in um, Baja, California, Sea of Cortez and further south along the coast. And they do a, a north-south migration in the uh, late summer. And um, we get a lot of juveniles and quite a few of the adults. And there's a um, National Audubon Society is conducting surveys 
and attempting to get a handle on the populations because they've um, been witnessing a um, reduction in um, the birth rate in Baja again. And uh, many of us, if you're in from the 60s, if you will, 50s, 60s, 70s, you'll remember the, the DDT uh, issue we had in both the osprey and the pelicans absorbing it into their digestive tract and the females uh, laying eggs with um, very thin shells because of the pesticides. So there's some concern that some of these pesticides um, are not um, regulated in some of these uh, areas where the birds nest and brown pelican is on a watch list. They're not endangered, but we've had a few years of reduced um, birth rate. And uh, so there's a concern. The other bird that we get a lot of, and he's here all year, and that is our Western uh, gull. And he's a big gull and he has a real slate back, his uh, primary wings and his back is a slate gray. This picture doesn't do it justice, but he has rather red legs. These uh, look a little bubble gummy or anemic, but <laughs> those are red legs. And he's here year round. And you can tell him from the other gulls, not only by his size and his bill, but his head is always white. Now, this time of the year, if you go out and walk on the breakwater around the marina, you'll see a lot of gulls with smudgy heads and dirty looking. And of course there's new birds. Some of these gulls have a four year cycle before they go into uh, their adult plumage. So um, you'll, uh, you'll see maybe up to five different species of gulls. And then we have these resident birds that are, that are just uh, gorgeous birds and they are the black oyster catchers. And about 20 years ago, I was involved with the National Audubon Society and there was a, um, a concern that um, there was a lack of habitat and we were gonna lose the black oyster catchers and the Audubon Society in the early 90s, uh, late 80s, did a survey for five years, uh, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, California, and Baja. And they found 20,000 pairs, had a lot of volunteers out and um, the volunteers did a fabulous job of finding all the birds that were available and um, they came off the watch list and the concern. And now here in the breakwater for Loch Lomond, the other day I had eight of them, eight black oyster catchers together and they were feeding on the rocks. So they're permanent residents. We're very fortunate to have them, beautiful birds. So about this time of the year, we start to get a lot of ducks in uh, from the north and from the east, from the inner mountain areas. These are greater scops, a male and a female. You'll see them in the bay. And they start arriving a little bit later, late October. And of course, they're dependent on storm fronts too. If it's like this year and we're in a drought and there isn't storms in the, um, to the north uh, and the weather is pretty good. And as long as there's food in the lakes that they're, um, they're resident on, they'll stay into November. We're just start, starting to get the first um, sizable um, rafts of these birds in the bay. Uh, here's another bird that you'll see off the breakwater. It's, um, the last photo was a, a scalp male and female, and this is a male ruddy duck. And all, by the way, all of these photos are, taking, are taken in, um, in and around the breakwater, the marina, and the wetlands over by Beach um, Street and up by McNear uh, Brick Factory. So these are all local birds, local photos, and um, for instance, the two scop in the last photo and this duck, uh, the ruddy duck I took last week. So these birds are around, you can see them on your own. Um, and uh, if you see me walking around with my dog, Quincy and a scope and a camera and binoculars, you can ask me a little bit more of the questions because I do go out here often. Um, at the parking lot on the far east side of um, the marina, there's a mitigated wetland mitigated for uh, development, I think for the housing development that's closer to um, Andy's market. And right now it's really dry, but other years it's been really wet. And we've had cinnamon teal in there and green wing teal and widgeons, five or six different species of duck. Uh, I've had rails in there. And of course, all the different uh, shorebirds that we're looking at tonight, except we don't see the black oyster catcher in there because they don't have a food source there. They stay on the rocks and get snails and slugs and crabs and 
uh, clams and other crustaceans that come up. But this is habitat. And in any given year, it's full of ducks. And this is off of Beach Street. It's a beautiful wetland. It seems to be, uh, have tidal action on it. So it has water uh, every day, practically. I don't live there. I don't see it every day. But I'm, I suspect it has a reasonable amount of water uh, that comes through a culvert through tidal action. So this is a good area for birding. Um, when we did the Boxes Swift presentation uh, several uh, weeks ago, uh, Bonnie had at the back of her home through this area, Boxes Swift coming over the wetlands eating insects. Um, so some of the birds you might see there would be the tricolor blackbird, it's an unusual visitor. Uh, they're on the watch list in California uh, in agricultural areas. Unfortunately, they like um, um, grasslands and high reeds, as you can see this bird, and silage that the um, agricultural community raises for feeding camel, uh, cattle. And they harvest it right at the peak of the nesting season. So a lot of the young birds are chopped up and um, nesting is really disrupted. And at one time there were 20 million tricolored blackbirds in California. And I think we're down now to about 450,000. Still a lot of birds, but the pressure on them through um, the um, harvesting cycle for agricultural means uh, plays a pretty big role on just how many of these birds will have left. So National Audubon and California Audubon is constantly hit fundraising and attempting to buy ranches or to buy um, the inventory of the harvest before it gets harvested. So the farmer or rancher, whatever you want to call them, is paid for growing their um, crop and allowing the birds to nest and not harvesting it. And uh, Audubon and other groups actually pay the rancher not to harvest at the rate of what his um, production resale would have been. And it's working out and we're getting more and more of these areas um, to at least one harvest cycle not to be uh, implemented. And the birds have a chance to nest, raise their young and get the young out and go into other areas. So that's a success story. Uh, Brewer's Blackbird is one of my favorite birds. It's just gorgeous. This picture really doesn't do the justice I was hoping for, but they're a natural native North American blackbird. They were here before all of us and um, they like people. Well, I, when I have out of town visitors and they want to see one, I typically take them to Safeway parking lot, um, Trader Joe's or uh, United or one of those are always in a parking lot, but they are a native bird and we do find them in uh, in natural areas also and they flock. They're a typical blackbird, you know. Uh, I was up in Yolo County just a week ago and we had flocks of five and 10,000 of them for the winter. But a beautiful bird and native bird. Uh, this is an interesting bird. This is the ruddy turnstone. It's a rare visitor to the marina. His cousins, uh, the black turnstones, um, frequent the, the marina often on the rocks with the black turnstones and the pelicans and the willets and all the other um, shorebirds. And this bird, um, this photo is about three years old and this bird is in breeding plumage. And I caught this in uh, April and before the bird was leaving and I went back the next day and it was gone. It was on its flight north. It was a one day wonder. And that's the ruddy turnstone. And we should look for that bird. We're obviously on their, their flight pattern, or at least this one in particular. Uh, the willet, willet's a favorite bird. It's a large bird. It has the body the size of a gull, if you will. It's long-legged. Um, when it flies, it has black wing panels. I don't have this in flight, unfortunately, but you'll see it. Long gray bill. And they're a nester in the Sierra Nevadas, the Cascades, and the inner mountain regions of some of the states that I mentioned earlier, Montana, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada. And um, they're always calling. And they're a little bit noisy, I guess, depending on, on your sensitivity. But you always know they're around because they're always yakking. And they're a very social bird. They have no problem co-mingling with other birds. Um, in the background here are the um, marble gawits. And they always seem to get along. Another long-billed bird. I haven't seen them uh, this year in, uh, in the area. They. Uh, you, we used to be able to see them in a wet year in that uh, dry pond area, the mitigated area that I had the, uh, uh, the photo of a few slides back. But 
when an area, when a wetland like that is dry, they they just can't feed. So they might end up going towards China Camp, uh, further north to San Pablo Bay, uh, wildlife refuge where there's a lot of uh, a lot more wetlands and beaches. Uh, of course, the great egret. Uh, the great egret is um, a regular year-round visitor. Uh, there's a huge nesting colony in the Belmarine Keys just north of our area. Um, my partner and I, Janet and I, we do a annual survey of the nesting uh, great egrets in uh, Belmarine Keys. And uh, this last year we had 72 nests, that's 144 individuals, and they have up to three uh, chicks a year. So not all of them last. We find a lot of dead birds thrown out. There are uh, great horned owls around that we believe might take some young birds. There's ravens and red-tailed hawks. But even if they, um, even if one of the youth or the babies, the hatchier birds were able to be successful, that'd be another 72 on top of that. You know, you're looking at just in San Pablo Bay, close to 300 uh, great egrets year round feeding. So one of the neat things that we don't talk about is the amount of, um, of food, the protein in, um, in our wetlands, both um, offshore like this bird in a couple inches of water or the wetlands um, like around um, McNear Beach uh, in that area, um, Beach Street, the wetlands there, um, and some of the, the shorelines. There's just a lot of good food and that helps keep these birds around. In fact, here's a rare bird alert. A year and a half ago, possibly two years now, a little blue heron, a resident of the Southeast in Mexico came up and um, one of the residents uh, just north of, north, uh, excuse me, Southwest of you by the, across from Target um, discovered this bird in their wetlands around their, uh, their housing community. And this particular picture here, this photo was recorded off of Beach Street, um, right down the street from, uh, from Loch Lomond. And the bird stayed, I believe, for maybe up to four months and was going back and forth from Beach Street and would end up in the wetlands by the um, marina. And then it would fly back into the wetlands uh, near Target. And so it was, uh, people came from all over California to see this bird. Uh, in the birding community, there's sort of a club called county birders and how many birds you can see in each county. And the magic number is 200 species in each county. So there were people that um, you know, had just a few birds or a number of birds in Marin County, but didn't have this one. So they travel all the way to Marin County to see this bird, take their photos. Um, hopefully they spent a little money and helped our economy and got another bird for their county list. So. We do attract um, rare birds. We had, I showed the picture of the uh, ruddy turnstone. We could consider that rare. And certainly um, this little blue heron from the Southeast. Okay. So pickleweed marshes subject to tidal action. This is taken um, to the north of McNear, McNear uh, Brickyard and it's subject to tidal action. And um, it's a good spot for um, rails. And um, this picture is about a year old, this photo. And uh, you can see it was after a storm and we had uh, a wet area with the pickle weed and we had a Sora rail. So Soras are part of the chicken family and um, Galenus is the Spanish word for chicken. I may not have that 100% correct, but it's pretty, pretty close. If I'm wrong, someone correct me. So Las Galenas marshes, um, have a number of different types of rails. We have the um, endangered uh, Ridgeway Rail, which used, which used to be the Clapper Rail and has been renamed. Uh, we have the Virginia Rail and we have the Sora Rail. And there's potential there for the little black rail. It's a little bit larger than a sparrow. Um, so we have quite a few rails in our area. We have up to four species. And if you look real hard, um, you might see them just walking around. They're fairly comfortable with humans and they, um, they chatter a lot. You'll hear them before you see them. And um, the Spanish um, and the early Mexican uh, residents of Marin County uh, would just go collect them. 
and they would be used for dinner because they're part of the chicken family, the Las Galinas Creek and Las Galinas wetlands to our north. I know it's not part of the San Pablo Bay uh, or San Pedro Road Coalition, but we do get them also. Okay, so mudflats. We talked about nutrition and food and a reason why we attract so many different bird species and we keep them through uh, their migration cycle is because we have a very rich area. Um, uh, citizens groups, volunteer groups, such as the uh, Wetlands Committee that we had that we're presenting for tonight do so much to identify these areas to our government representatives and keep them pristine and keep them open and keep them out of development and make them available for these birds that uh, share their life cycle with us. You know, this is our home as human beings and it's their home as mammals and birds and, and other creatures. And, uh, you know, we all have to have that mutual respect. And uh, this is the wetlands be uh, that's adjacent to Beach Road. It's to the west of Beach Road. And it feeds into the Beach uh, Street wetlands photo that I had um, a few slides back through a culvert through tidal action. And this is a good spot to look for um, sandpipers and plovers. If you go on low tide, uh, you're going to see this little uh, peep. Some people call them peep, peeps. Other people just sandpipers, but they're part of a family of small sandpipers. This is a least sandpiper. Its cousin is a western sandpiper, and there's um, several differences. The easiest thing, if you're a beginning birder, is to look for these yellow um, legs, uh, black droopy bill. You'll see it, and just sort of a mottled bib, upper chest, upper belly. And that's the least sandpiper and you find them generally like this, just pecking around in the mud and getting all sorts of biomass that they feed on this sludgy stuff that gets turned around with tidal action. And this, this here's six, but you might see 600 at one time. And that's not an exaggeration. You might see 6,000. Uh, Point Blue, which used to be Point Ray's um, Bird Observatory does annual spring and winter and spring counts on these birds and we have 50 to 60,000 of them in the Bay Area. That's all the way down to Alviso in Santa Clara County and all the way up into Napa into the Napa wetlands, the least sandpipers. <clears throat> Here's a western sandpiper. Um, this photo is taken in Alaska. It's in breeding plumage and um, but I added it just so you would have an idea of the difference in the birds. First off, if you're a beginner birder, and you're looking is the black legs, okay? But it also has a black bill with a little droop at the tip, a little bit wider, a little bit bigger. And look at all the chestnut and the breeding plumage. And then all these chevrons, this is very key. If you go back to the uh, leaf sandpiper, they have that bib in all white. So there's some differences. So as, as you begin to bird, you begin to take notice of all these different plumages and different ways of identifying birds. So uh, Western sandpipers, for whatever the reason, seem to uh, tend to go into our East Bay shoreline and uh, we get more of the least sandpipers. And here's a beautiful family of black-bellied um, plover and black turnstones. Here's the black belly plovers. Got well, one, two, and three, four, and five. And then we have uh, four black um, turnstones just beautiful birds and they're on the very, very tip of the um, breakwater uh, for the Loch Lomond Marina, just gorgeous birds. And um, so you wanna look for them. And they're easy to identify if you're a beginning birder or if you're getting interested in birding, they're easy to identify. I might add here that if you are interested in birding, you might wanna start a list of birds early on and um, because as, as you get further into birding, you're gonna start saying, oh, I saw that bird before, but I don't know where, and it doesn't hurt to start a list early on. So here is a black belly plover and a black turnstone. So um, these are fall plumages birds. This bird has come all the way from, I'm just gonna exaggerate and say probably um, somewhere in Alaska. Let's pretend it came from Homer, Homer, Alaska, where it nested and uh, made its uh, migratory flight all the way down to San Pablo Bay. 
and it's in its fall plumage. And um, I think here it is in its breeding plumage. So you can see the exaggerated um, molt that they go through. So that's breeding. And, uh, you know, we're all familiar with the um, male birds are always really bossed out and super cool and, and attracting males, uh, females, excuse me. And this is what they look like in the fall when they go through one of their breeding cycles. And the same for the um, uh, black belly plover. Uh, he is much blacker, slate black, you know, like in the last photo that I showed during his breeding plumage. Uh, this fall bird, you see he starts to get molted out. Uh, you can tell his feathers are worn probably from a long migration. You can see some of these feather tips are fresh. You see some of these new feathers coming out. So part of the um, reason for the molt on these long distance migrants is um, with the sun and the wearing and they go through a mating season and deprive themselves of a lot of their uh, nutrition and their minerals and vit vitamins uh, to keep their feathers in good shape. And then after a long migration, uh, those feathers are really burnt out and they go through the uh, post-migration um, uh, molt here in the Bay Area and start to get new feathers and get ready for the, the flight north in several months. So this bird is pretty thin. If, uh, if there are experienced birders out there, they've seen the uh, adults in the breeding plumage and they get much bigger and they get all fattened up from all the nutrients they're getting out of the mud flats, all the crustaceans and biomass and biofilm that they feed on. They get big and um, their organs get larger as they get ready for migration and they put on a lot of body fat to prepare themselves uh, for these long flights. And some uh, species of birds um, even shut down the muscles in their wings while they're putting on fat and they don't fly a lot. They just sort of peck around and put on fat. And then whatever timetable they're on, whatever keys them in, they begin to build muscle in their flight wings so they can prepare themselves for these long migrations. And it's um, quite a cycle. Uh, here's a beautiful juvenile. This is what we call a hatch year, black bellied plover. And I caught this bird in September of this year. And this photo was taken from uh, the breakwater again. Just a beautiful bird. Now, look at all these beautiful little feathers. Look at the tips. And you can see some of these are worn already. So this bird, I don't know where it was born, but it was pretty far north and it had to fly its way all the way down. So it's going to eventually look like that bird and that bird. And that's what the molt cycles do, do. but it is a gorgeous bird. Um, we also get long-billed dow witchers in the winter, wintering plumage. This is a, a bird in the Beach Street Marsh again. That's a good spot to go bird watching. And it's got that nice little road around without a lot of traffic. And um, this bird is in a molt also, as you can see. This is more of the breeding plumage. And this is a fall picture or photo, excuse me. And um, this bird has arrived from, once again, the inner mountain regions. Most of our birds here on this uh, presentation are breeders in Idaho and Sierra Nevadas and Cascades and Wyoming. Maybe some of these birds might get into the Dakotas, Eastern Colorado, um, New Mexico, Northern New Mexico. And um, so some, they have these long, long migration flights. You know, and once they get here, they start to go through these molts. Look at these beautiful feathers. Um, here's a pair. This is a, a, a spring photo and you can see the uh, breeding plumage is starting to come in slowly, all these, um, barred feathers and both in the flanks and in the tails. And you get more of the variegated variegation into the primary feathers for their wings and into the scapulars and around the nape. And so feathering is a big part of birding. You really get into some of these birds with their feathers. So we're um, almost done here and um, we are done. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending tonight. And I'd like to ask everyone if you have time to go to the Yellow Bill Tours website for field trips and local birding classes uh, that I do uh, here locally in your favorite uh, local park or in your backyard or front yard or down at the marina. And then Yellow Bill Tours has got some trips planned for Belize. Belize is now open, COVID-19 restrictions, but um, the American Airlines 
United, Southwest, and all are flying there again in New Mexico in April. Hopefully we'll have a vaccine by then and, and we'll feel a little bit more liberal in our, in our traveling. So um, that's it. It's always a pleasure. I hope to do one of these again for uh, the San Pedro Road uh, Committee. And here we are. I'm complete. Well, thank you, Rich. That that was really fascinating. All these, this bird, these these migrations and trajectories that you know most of us aren't even aware of. And it's particularly interesting about the black belly plover because I've seen them transform. I remember I saw my first one. I wasn't really sure if it was a black belly plover or not. <laughs> and then lo and behold, it got this black belly. So <laughs> over time, so very How interesting. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, I see I have a few from the audience. So the first, do the black turnstones have a large red bill? Yes, they do because the way they, uh, so these bills are developed um, on their feeding regiments. And um, just the other day I was off um, at Loch Lomond and um, I failed to get a good photo, so I didn't put it up, but there were three black uh, uh, oyster catchers and two of them were tugging on a snail on the rocks. And they had mm. both had mm -hmm. really good grip on that snail and the third bird was watching them. But uh, <laughs> so, you know, they're tools. They're like our forks and spoons and knives for the birds. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah. the, you know, they're developed for those particular uh, sources of food that they uh, they forage for. Yeah, long red bill. Okay, so those, so I guess those are, those are the black oyster catchers that have the bills, not the turnstones. Correct. Turnstones have okay. a much smaller bill. Okay. Much smaller. And then I okay, much smaller, and not uh, necessarily orange or black or red. Correct. Okay, and then somebody has asked if. There are better times of day to observe birds. Well, is there, best, is there an optimal time to go out bird watching or birding? Well, for shorebirds, you know, low tide is is good um, because they'll be around pecking, and and it seems like they flock and and feed together. So you'll get a lot of the long wading birds. You'll get the short legged um, sandpipers. Um, you may get different gulls that are. Mm foraging around. You may even get ravens, um, crows, um, and but for shorebirds, um, that's a good time. High tide is a good time for ducks and for uh, terns, for diving birds, uh, longer wading birds. Well, the longer wading birds, like the herons and the egrets, uh, they're at an advantage with those long legs. They forage in low tides and they forage in high tides. They're just, you know, they have mm. options that the uh, smaller birds don't have. And of course, um, I've seen uh, both of the, uh, all three of the long-legged um, wading birds that I just mentioned, the egrets and the terns flying in from the islands and they make that flight. So, and come into that small little beach just to the west of um, where the boat launch is by Andes and they forge around in through there. So uh, on land birds, um, uh, there's a, sort of a thought process that early morning is good for land birds. Um, I think that's more in the summer when insects are available and a lot of our migrant birds are in from Central America, South America, and they're fly catching. In the winter months, I don't go out <laughs> much before 9.30 because uh, mm. you want it to warm up. Um, I am a volunteer up at the Hawk Watch for uh, Golden Gate Recreation Area. And um, the really good hawk watching, if you're into raptors, uh, you need heat. So mid-morning, uh, even later morning and all afternoon for raptors, like that bald eagle, you know, I don't know how long it was perched off on the islands, but um, it was warm. It was probably in the higher 60s and there was a lot of heat. It was an interesting flight pattern. It went um, a little bit um, past uh, Beast, uh, Beach Street and looked like it was going to go towards Peacock Gap, uh, Gap by the, um, on the way to McNair Beach in China Camp. And it hit those big trees there and it made a left-hand turn and it, I followed it for maybe 10 minutes and it went over San Rafael and that's when I lost it. And that was, that was probably by 4.30 in the afternoon. 
So oh, raptors a little bit later in the day, uh, seasonal intuitive birding, you know, mornings for uh, South American migrants in the summer when it's cooler and insects hatch. And in the winter, stay in bed and go out at 9.30. <laughs> Have an extra cup of coffee. <laughs> I think people are happy for that advice. <laughs> yeah. um, and then I have another uh, question, which I've heard, this is not the first time I've heard this, is concern over the fact that there used to be a lot of egrets nesting on the islands. Like they used to turn the, uh, those little islands off of the breakwater white. And now they hmm. just aren't even around anymore. Do you know what's going on with that? Well, I live here on Is that something um, we should be in, in Larkspur on Corte Madera Creek, and we have uh, Piper Parks about a quarter mile down from me. And every day I have, so I walk my dog there. And some days I'm there twice, but for sure once a day. And um, the egrets fly, fly by my home at sunrise. I might get 20 egrets at a time. And they go into the slough there and um, feed and then I see them just before sunset flying back out and I believe um, through a couple different groups the Audubon Ranch out of Bolinas um, and Point Blue the old Point Rays does a lot of surveys and the snowy egrets nest on the islands the great egrets uh, nest in Valmarin Keys and the great blues nest right around the corner um, from um, the San Pedro Road uh, Coalition just past China Camp on uh, off of the um, Las Galinas uh, marshlands there. There's an open space that's owned by Marin um, County Parks and they nest in the eucalyptus trees there. And we've been uh, surveying those nests officially uh, for four years and there's up to five nests and once again, they have up to three young at a time. And um, the great blue herons are a, a real local nester. So I think the birds, the, the, net, the, the population seem to be stable. They may change, you know, roost sites or resting sites just because, you know, maybe something just isn't right for them. Uh, Okay. I think that's, yeah, that's what people were wondering is if they're just yeah. shifting where they roost. Yeah, if you're out Well, about, I think uh, that's it for the question. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank you uh, again, Rich. It was so informative. I learned a lot myself um, just about uh, the patterns of birds coming and going. And we're definitely looking forward to, you know, another okay. presentation mm -hmm. in 2021. And I want to thank everybody who attended. And um, I just, uh, I'm going to offer again, if you love our wildlife, to please uh, come attend our first wetlands committee meeting the third week in January. And we'll set out the specific date and time. And um, just, uh, we also just invite you to return to our presentations because we have more planned for 2021 both about birds and other related areas to the wetlands, um, you know, what the climate change and how that's impacting us. And uh, I wanna wish everybody a very happy holiday, a safe holiday with your loved ones holiday season and stay safe. And um, again, our warm wishes to you from the Point San Pedro Road Coalition. And good night. Good night, everybody.